Yeah. Well. Yeah. So just just to get us going, I thought we'd just sort of go through what we put in the advert, which was, you know, the purpose of the workshop is to explore the implicit or psychological level of relationship that is co-created in an ongoing process between us. And, you know, our proposition here tonight is about that the accounting for the implicit level is crucial to our understanding of healthy as well as problematic relational patterns. And we're going to draw on the ideas from Dynamic Ego States, which is a paper that Graham wrote back in 2011. And we'll bring in various bits and pieces. And my invitation is for you to bring all of yourselves into this as well, because you will all have lots to contribute. But we'll bring in some neuroscience, another, some maybe some stuff from cognitive science as well. And our hope is to provide opportunities for you to relate this to your personal and professional experience and practice. Yeah. And so Graham and I are really interested to know, you know, what's brought you here? What's your interest? What is it you, you want from tonight? So I'd sort of, I think we could put that off. Oh, do you want to put yeah. that off now, Graham? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop that for now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or do you I, want, did you want to do one of the other slides as well or not? No, I think, I think it'd be interesting to hear from people and say hello and, and also, um, uh, pay attention not just to the content but to the process you know is there something about the process perhaps you're hoping for here it might not just be the content perhaps mm. you're you're looking to connect with other colleagues a sense of community um you know perhaps you know um you get stimulated in ways you hadn't expected you know when you come on workshops like this it's not just about the content it's also about how we relate with each other um so i'm just going to stop that share yeah. and uh Say hello. Yeah. Anybody willing to pitch in? Hello. Hi, Mary. Hi, I'm up in Cumbria. Excellent. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we speaking a little bit about why we're here just now? Yeah. Yeah. What are you yeah. curious about in relation to this subject? Or... Um, well, I'm studying. I've just... Um, just got my certificate for my foundation year studying TA. Uh -huh. my, my goal is to be a, a, a TA psychotherapist. So I'm wanting to, I'm curious and I'm getting deeper and deeper into the, into the learning. Uh -huh. um, and reading your part of the article that was sent to us. Um, I'm feeling it's, it's very, I'm just at the very beginning of, of comprehension of, of this level, but mm -hmm. it feels it feels familiar. It feels I've been rudimentary feeling these things while because I've been going through therapy for two years myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the way the way things change in the relationship um, and my own levels of perception, mm -hmm. they they went through. Um, fascinating and, and and wonderful. So I'm just gonna gonna see what I can take away from it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Mary. Um, I, I appreciate. You know, we will have people here right across the range, the spectrum, in terms of perhaps experience of TA, or, or even if not TA, psychotherapy, counselling. You know, like lots of people have related experience, and uh, so we're gonna have a. You know, I expect we'll have a range. Um, uh, and and thank you also for commenting on the paper. It may you know we we sent that out as a stimulus that maybe you have all sorts of associations, connections, reflections on that that could also feed into this. So mm -hmm. thank thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. Hi there, I'm Carol, and I'm in Sussex. Hi, Carol. Hi there. I'm also in training. Um, I'm just about to start the um clinical year three and um, mm -hmm. i was just interested to find out more really i thought it was a great opportunity to do that mm. yeah i'm just i'm just really curious as well and, and <laughs> to the workshop it's the it's the main thing that drives learning is curiosity yeah that's that's mm. so important great to have you here carol thank yeah. you hi everyone i am um, 
Can you hear me? Yep. Mm. I'm really, really interested in, I've been doing some reading around, um, so like polyvagal and the limbic system and how clients mm -hmm. really sort of, one of the things they get from therapy is access to our limbic system as we calm theirs. And I'm just interested in it as a concept. Mm -hmm. And this seemed to really layer into that. So actually what's going mm -hmm. on in the relationship between the two people. Um, yeah, just the, sort of the richness underneath what's being said. Mm -hmm. So this came through, I literally just read a book on it and this came through. So I thought this is great for putting the TA lens on it and really yeah. enriching that idea. Nice. I, I, lo I like that idea of a TA lens. You know, one of the ways in I, which I often think about TA, it's a bit like a graphical user interface for all sorts of psychology and, you know, and, and increasingly the neuroscience as well. And certainly I think the polyvagal stuff is fascinating. And, and if anything, it's a really, um, uh, it's a reminder of the importance to attending our own therapy, to our own development, our own self-care, because you know unless we are in a capacity to regulate our own experience we can't help someone else do that you know in in relationship mm -hmm. with them so nice connections amanda mm -hmm. I'll come in. I'm, 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 sorry I've okay. Come. Can you hear me? yeah you go now. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you um so i've i'm on my TA, CTA journey at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I obviously have, I know about the, the schools, the TA schools and the relational approach. I'm very familiar with all those. And I felt that I wanted to sort of, you know, enrich my knowledge mm -hmm. and obviously co-created, uh, co-creative uh, way of working is to me, it's reasonably new so mm -hmm. i'm very interested to enrich my knowledge um mm -hmm. and also to you know take away some ideas that i could use in my practice as well so uh, i'm really excited to learn so i'm really sorry i didn't get time to read the article graham <laughs> <laughs> It's just I finished about 20 minutes before or 15 minutes before our session here. And I just thought, no, I just need a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, do what you need to do. There's always time for there's always time for so reading. I do apologize that I haven't read out. Uh, yeah. But I'm really I, I, yeah. I, I'm not here expecting everyone to be prepared and having read the article and made notes. So don't worry about that. I, I'm just like just really just like to get an interesting conversation with you. Um, and and um, uh, and it's interesting what you're saying, you know, of course, is that you, you know, you have experience of other uh, schools, if you like, of TA or other approaches. That's fantastic. And so one of the off, I think one of the thing, ways we learn is we we make associations, connections with what we already know. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I say might jar with what you already know, but that's just grist for the mill you know we put that in and some of it you might say oh yes it feels a bit like or you know you you make those connections so brilliant that's that's mm -hmm. all part of the richness thank you Vina. i'll come in then um yeah <clears throat> sorry i'm claire i'm gratefully um here this evening i'm in my first year of post postgrad um what am I? Right. <laughs> Just need to land. I graduated from um, my TA four year diploma mm -hmm. uh, last year. So I'm in my kind of first year of doing that. Yeah. Um, I found the course that I was on was very heavy in certain um, types of TA and not other types of TA. Mm -hmm. And I have an amazing um, supervisor who knows of you and your work and has worked with you and stuff so they were a, he was able to um introduce your work mm -hmm. to me and in and and it gave that and i think it was because of how i was working that he then introduced right. this even though i hadn't read any of the stuff so wow. that felt really good i'm a primary school I was, I was a primary school teacher for 23 years as well so that's i work co-creatively within the classroom and so mm. this was a really good crossover um and i love i love 
what you said in the article about how the positive parts and the and the positive feelings with your clients is just as important for the healing because sometimes I sit in these sessions and I'm like are we just having like a really nice time is this am I you know and, and my, uh-huh. my training is always like get them in child get them crying you know and all that kind of stuff and it's just like I don't have that every session but still my clients are healing and growing and coming back and doing really well and it's all in that relationship and it's all in the space that we create together that's safe enough for them to explore themselves yeah. their history but also their accomplishments and, and what they've achieved and the positives mm-hmm. as well so yeah I've, I'm I really I'm really with you on that um yeah, and thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've tried to attend as many of these as I can, <laughs> almost to kind of fill that void that I feel was has been yes. being co-created yes. with TA as part of my course. Um, and yeah, I was delighted when I saw that you Carter together with yourselves and and the team have put together this course. Yeah, this little series of of trainings. It's yeah, thank you, Claire. And thank you for your reflections as well about you know the. the the value of attending to health or the value of attending to the positivity. And, and, and I think what we know, um, almost at a, we probably all know it intuitively, you know, but also, you know, from a, from a, um, a, a physiological perspective, that distressing emotions are often much more powerful than pleasant emotions. Um, and, and it's almost as though, you know, in that drama, they can hog the show. And, um, you know, there's a lot of positive psychologists talk a lot of, uh, uh, about this a whole idea of um, learning to turn the dial down on emotions, you know, and, and as you as you as you as you do heal, uh, really paying attention to and giving more space for um, um, pleasant, satisfying emotional experiences and relationships that nourish your life. Um, and it's, you know, that's what getting off the drama t- triangle, you know, maybe it's not as exciting, but actually it's, it's, it's somehow learning to trust in that as, as actually mm. a, a, a sustainable, nourishing, you know, way, way mm. to be. So I, I was, you know, um, appreciating your story and your, 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 your comments and your reflections about that. Mm. And I also appreciated the way in which you referred to, you, you can bring it into your teaching. Because I think one of the things about co-creative TA is it's very applicable in many, many different environments. And for me, it brings up sort of questions about we've got all we've got our four fields, but where are the boundaries? Mm. Because I can see co-creative TA works in any of them very well. I want to say that um, I'm really appreciating people who have spoken, but I don't want you to feel a pressure that you have to. So it's okay not to as well. Um, um, but what might be worth attending to is, you know, sometimes people around you speak and you feel like they're saying something similar to you, what you might have said anyway, and almost as though they're, they're voicing something you feel or think. Um, but if there's something you feel like, oh, you just want to pitch in with, because maybe it's not been mentioned or something you would like to, to, to share uh, as a way of, of checking in with us, then, then please do. I'd like to come in after Claire because a lot of what you said, Claire, really resonated with me. And also, I'm also um, outside of the therapeutic field. Mm -hmm. I'm a psychologist by background and I work within organisations, both one to one as a coach and also with teams. And Mm -hmm. I have a a legacy of working with um, large scale organisational change and transformation. Mm. Having said that, um, oh, congrats, Mary, in terms of your certificate on your foundation. And uh, that was me last year. And I've just completed my first year in EdTA and oh. loving it. Um, yeah, re- re- really enjoying that. So, so looking forward to year two. I'm really excited about co-creative because it really sings to my ba- personal and professional values in the way that I Mm. seek to to work um whether it be one-to-one or in groups or uh, organizations spanning the organization which can be somewhat alien to the people that i'm working with Mm. 
and mm -hmm. I, I again forgiveness. Um, I read your paper years ago. I thought, yes, this speaks to me. And then you've done some other stuff as well before co-creative was really a known term. I thought, yes, I'm really getting this. This, you know, I'm really buying into this. Um, however, again, uh, pressure has meant that I didn't do my homework beforehand. But um, glancing through it again very quickly, a lot of the it just rings. It just rings. I'm not going to say rings true for me. It just it just lands with me well. Mm -hmm. And I love co-creative because of, in terms of ethos, because of its organic and emergent nature, as well as the fact that it's collaborative, if that's making. Right. Okay. The ways in which some of the ways where, where thinking and writing is resonating with some of your values. And a, a, exactly. And, and mm. the way that I practice. So why am I here? I'm here because my curiosity is always uh, dialed up. So exploratory curiosity for learning and to really just 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 take this opportunity to um add breadth and depth to my understanding of co-creative as a as concept and, and its principles but also in the moment just kind of checking in with myself in terms of where am i with all mm -hmm. of this so yeah learning in the moment so to speak Brilliant. And, and I noticed, you know, a diversity is building or emerging in terms of different ways people might be using it. You know, you might be using it in a therapeutic setting, exactly. in an educational setting, in an organisational setting. Um, uh, that's my context. I work at London Business School. I have done for about 17 years. Um, I'm not a psych psychotherapist anymore. I stopped that about 2006. Um, so that's the context in which I work and you know bring these perspectives and uh, obviously james you're a psychotherapist so yeah, you know we've right. got you know we've got that those kind of differences ro rolling here mm. so, thank you sandra yeah just say hello to linda who's just come hi linda just talking about why we've come and what, what, what why this topic has interested us. Okay. I wonder... Okay. Sorry. Oh, I was going to jump in and say hello. Hi, Rachel. I appreciated you saying that we didn't have to check in, but James is my supervisor, and I kind of feel if I don't check in, he's going to want to, <laughs> want to know why. So. All right, you, you, you might be in trouble, really? yeah, I know. Well, yeah, I mean, I, then I thought you also you'd be like, no, not really, but still, I kind of felt some pressure, James. So oh, um, oh, I'm in Crowborough, oh, um, James is my supervisor, so he's one of the reasons I'm here, um, oh, because he talks about a lot of co-creative TA when we're having our supervision group. Um, I'm presently writing my CTA, and so looking at things slightly different, taking in more information, more learning, um, trying to find more language as well um, mm -hmm. as I write that. So this has been really mm -hmm. useful. Well, this is useful for today. Um, looking at what goes on between me and my client and finding a different way actually to articulate my experience with them. I, I, I love that as, a, as a, an orientation towards theory. It's, it's like, you know, we're, we're trying, to find, trying to articulate um experience um are trying to articulate what it is we do perhaps um uh and of course that's an open-ended project you know goes on and on uh, and um and for me that's also part of the richness you know like that actually um some uh, often when i read people it's the turn of phrase or it's a particular you know way they might talk about an, an experience that may feel familiar to me at one level but somehow the way they articulate that just helps me um, uh, helps me perhaps understand a bit at a, at a deeper level or stimulates me to kind of articulate my experience in a different way. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that's a lovely, lovely way of putting it. Thank you. And perhaps unless someone wants to say more, um, uh, that might be a really good prompt for looking at the next slide and for, for um, uh, so, so 
you know, how do how do uh, in co-creative TA do we think about the the implicit relationship or implicit processes? What what might that look like through a co-creative TA lens? So um, so I want to share some some uh, ideas with you, some some words, some pictures, um, and as I do that, uh, just notice where you go, you what associations you make, um, what you get curious about in the process. Um, so let me come back to sharing my screen. Was, share, that should be fine. Um, I've got multiple screens on the go here. It's always good fun. Um, and see if this works. Now resume slideshow, that should work. Ta-da! <laughs> so, um, I'm a big fan of Berwick Byrne. Um, and in some ways, uh, some of the ideas I'm going to talk about here, you know, have been very much stimulated by, by, by um, Byrnean psychology. But one of the things I was really curious about is, is how when he talked about ulterior transactions or ulterior communication, he's talking about two, two levels. Um, which he refers to as the social and psychological levels of communication. You're familiar with that idea with the ulterior, yeah? Um, uh, and one of the things he says in, in TAP, Transactional Analysis Psychotherapy, is that these terms, social and psychological, may not be scientifically impeccable, but these are the most cogent, clear, and convenient terms available. Um, I quite like that. And it's a, it's a, you know, of course he's writing in the late fifties. This book is early, it's 1961. Yes, of course, he's using what was available to him at the time in a way that perhaps best spoke or, or, or best um, articulated what he was trying to, to, to explore here. Um, uh, and I think, um, and obviously what we've said in our first slide is we talk about the, the implicit or the psychological level. So we're almost using those terms interchangeably. Um, so I, I want to give a little backdrop to that shift or that association um, in terms of some uh, TA um, thinkers. Um, and and then, uh, then I'll share some pictures of you. <laughs> that's, that's where I'm going with this. Um, so let me just nudge it along a bit. So yeah, I'd like to talk this idea of the adult adult ulterior. So this is something that Keith and I made reference to in our first article on co-creative TA back in 2000. Um, uh, one of the things we were playing with, we were talking about how, you know, the, the matrix of interaction with therapist and client I was a psychotherapist at the time. Um, and, uh, and so we were positing this idea of ulterior adult adult dynamics, you know, um, the, uh, the notion that something might seem obviously transferential, you know, and it's, it's an odd reversal, really, because the way Byrne often talked was that um, the, uh, the, the, the ulterior, the psychological level, um, he, he always spoke about that in terms of parent and child. He never spoke about it in terms of adult. Um, and I think um, what he was, um, and to be fair, given the time he was right, fair enough. Um, but I think we know a lot more now about implicit and explicit communication, explicit and explicit memory. Um, implicit co-regulation of affect. None of those terms were around there. In terms of, you know, what was available to him, those terms weren't around, but they're around to us. Uh, and in terms of um, keeping TA perhaps in sync in concurrent developments, it, it makes a lot of sense to me to be looking for more up-to-date terms that give us um, a, a way of conversing and relating to other, other disciplines. Um, so we talked about, and we also suggest this idea of non-exploitative ulterior transactions. That, you know, the, the ulterior is not to get you, 
to catch you out, to manipulate you, to con you. Actually, um, I mean, many ulterior transactions, which are which are actually really healthy, really adaptive, not necessarily conscious or explicit, but nonetheless significant in terms of regulating and co-regulating our relational spaces. This idea of adult having some sort of implicit level um, uh, or psychological level was being picked up by a couple of other theorists. So notably um, Novellino, Michelle Novellino in 2003 on, in the Ego State book talks about, um, uh, and he says another level of unconscious psychological level transaction, which is located in the adult ego state. So again, moving away from Byrne had this rooted entirely in parent and child, um, Novellino saying, hang on, I think there's something here some ways, ways in which we uh, communicate with each other at, a, at um, unconscious levels, right in the here and now, in a way that is appropriate, that actually contributes, in, in, in the way he's writing his paper, contributes to, to the therapy. Mm -hmm. um, um, Keith and I wrote um, a kind of a, um, we thought of it as a more accessible article on co-creative TA because we, we know we love jargon and get off on that somewhat together. So, uh, you know, our book and our original article is a bit wordy. And if you like that, that's great. But we wanted to also, you know, play with a little bit with, with a more accessible version. Um, uh, and it was in that article, which we published online, that we actually drew that adult, adult ulterior. We had you know, we had both social level and psychological level moving between a, a, adult act to adult. Um, and one of the things we were suggesting in that article is that in terms of um, improving your communication, to really understand or be curious about your explicit and implicit contribution to positive outcomes. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm hearing some of that uh, I think it was Claire, you were expressing that in terms of, you know, some of, you know, actually, there, there is, you know, a, a dimension of positivity in, in some of my interactions, and I'm sure that's making a difference to, to helping people move forward. Um, so, um, so perhaps as practitioners, we should be as interested in that at least as also what goes wrong, therapeutic ruptures, therapeutic enactments, you know, all, all, of, the, all of the things that um, uh, we're actually very well versed at within TA. It's a very rich and useful language for what goes wrong. And we thought it was a little bit underdeveloped for what goes right. And I think that was part of um, uh, Keith and I, uh, it's an ongoing interest for Keith and I, but it was very much part of us writing the article. Um, and then the other person, people I'd like to refer to are uh, and, uh, Helena Hargadin and Brian Fenton. They wrote a paper in 2005, really talking about the non-conscious processes in the adult, you know, in, in the adult adult relationship. Um, and th so they come up with this um, uh, sentence: "Adult processing may be more helpfully constituted as an integration of conscious, unconscious, verbal, and non-verbal experience." And relating in the here and now. Mm -hmm. So again, taking you know the unconscious, taking the psychological level um, out of you know it, it had been in Burnian terms. That was the parent and child. That was the stuff we needed to unpack and uncover in order to get well. Um, but I, but um, but I think um, ourselves, I think Novellino, I think Harvard and Fenton are, are both reaching for words and re reaching for a way of actually recognizing that actually there's a lot of really healthy stuff and important stuff that happens right now, appropriate in the here and now, that is, a, that is not about our archaic fixations or archaic projections. Mm -hmm. It's actually just a part of life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and obviously that, um, that might be something in particular we, we, we would might want to cultivate in our relationships with clients, whether that's as, as teachers, um, educators, therapists, um, consultants, because it's, it's really about uh, attending to what helps this relationship um, 
function, what helps it flourish um, uh, in a way that might then give us the capacity, perhaps the psychological safety to also tend to some of the stuff that hurts. And I think also, Graham, isn't it the case that, you know, this is perhaps easier to understand using the ego state model that you and Keith have developed as compared with a more classical structural model? Could be. Um, yeah. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But I, mm -hmm. I kind of I wanted I've spoken quite a bit mm. and I just wanted to pause and, and see reactions thoughts associations what, what's happening where are you going with this um positive and negative or interesting just like to how is it landing with you well I'm, am i making any sense if so what is making sense to you um where are you going with this And it's fine. It's also the other thing I think is really important is in a kind of a learning environment is don't feel like you've got to say something clever or ask a really smart question. You know, sometimes that's the way we shut, we shut ourselves down from learning experience. It's fine just to go with some sort of half-baked intuitive reaction um, or half-baked thoughts. You haven't quite even got the words for it yet, but you, you might be willing to have a go with us here. Uh, I really welcome that. I'd like to share my thought if that's okay. I'll set my sunglasses. Sure, Amanda. Yeah. It's just, and I wasn't going to say anything, but now I will. That <laughs> I'm reading it, thinking, okay, I haven't quite got my head around this, but inside of me, it feels true. So that's where I am with it. Mm -hmm. I probably yeah. couldn't re-explain this theory right now to somebody, mm -hmm. but it really feels like something that happens for me and is true. So that feels mm -hmm. important. Right, and. That sense, that that sort of emotional resonance, would would, would you link that to perhaps any particular words I, I I used? And was there any one or two words that even stand out for you? Is it even if you can't articulate it as a as a full sentence? You know, you have a sense of what you're resonating with. Um, it was it was something about maybe it's not archaic, maybe it's the stuff of life i don't know how you put it exactly okay and i thought well that's an int what a lovely idea actually <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that yeah. maybe some of it ad adult is it doesn't have to be um uh, clear it can be a little bit messy as well mm. nice one yeah. nice one yeah. um <laughs> sue and i used to run a workshop uh, we've run it several times uh, but we, uh, based on um and we're doing a lot of stuff based on Stern, Daniel Stern, and um, Panksepp, uh, emotional systems. Um, uh, and we use the story from Daniel Stern, and he talks about a marvelous mess. You know? um, I, and I love that phrase, even the phrase, a marvelous mess. It's like, hey, life is messy. It's ambiguous. It's mm. complicated. There's a ton of stuff we don't, we haven't actually figured out, you know, like we, you know, we, we have probably in terms of what there is to know, we, we just know a tiny bit and yet we seem to figure it out anyway, a lot of the time. And I, so I, 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 I resonate with that. For me, adult is not about kind of crystal clarity mm. at all. Mm. Uh, in fact, if anything, I think that can be defensive. Mm. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for pitching in. Anyone else want to pitch in and say gonna, hello? Hi there. I was going to share something. I went to thinking about dancing and I've just, since um, the pandemic, I've just had quite a few instances where I've just really felt like dancing. And I thought there was, I had one in the park last week, a bit of a long story, but I always thought that was a child place. But now I think about it, it really felt like an adult expression of joy and mm -hmm. moment. So that's, that's where I went to. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, one of the things that positive psychology people talk a lot about is um, it's um, a bit like, you know, we, we, might, we might need to analyse problems, but we probably need to savour health. Just savour it. 
It's like the savoring is it's what's important. Um, uh, I, that, that, so that you know, that's like the ooh, there's some 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 uh, ex, you know experience, some openness to the moment where you feel joy and you just want to move. Wonderful, gorgeous. We, I would certainly think about that kind of experience, probably in terms of an, ex, an expanded or expanding adult ego state. That's, um, that's, uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about ego states in a moment as, a, as, a, uh, as we get into this idea of implicit relationship. But mm -hmm. Any other reactions right now? Yeah, can I come in? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, hear, I can't see other people on my screen at the moment. I can just see you, Graham. Okay. Um, thank you for reminding me, Linda. What, what, the way Zoom works, I, I've got multiple screens, so I can see everybody and run my PowerPoint all at the same time. But um, if you just have one screen, it might be flooded with the words at the moment. So thank you for the nudge. And please help me with that as, as we go along. Sorry. Um, I sometimes yeah. forget what I've got running. So I'm going to stop sharing for now. Mm. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Thank Lovely. you, Linda. That, that sort of like helped because I didn't want to sort of come in and tread on somebody else. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Graham, in your, um, in your transactions with us, I really hear the positive, the psychological of I'm safe, um, I want to encourage you to be in contact with me. I want to um, make, make this stuff accessible to you. So mm -hmm. I hear that really clearly um, in the modeling of the way that you're transacting with us. Mm -hmm. so that was what was going on for me as I was listening to you. I was thinking, yeah, you're doing it. Right. Mm. Great. And, and what's your, um, so you're noticing a congruence between what I'm talking about and how I'm being with you. Yeah. What's your, what's your emotional response to that? Um, it, it made me want to come in. It made oh. me want to comment. Mm. So yeah, it, it did its job. Um, Brilliant. But I also hear you saying, actually, you know what? I just feel as nervous as you guys do. I hear that in your voice as well. That sort of, mm -hmm. yeah, the pos positive intent of inviting us mm -hmm. to, um, I was going to say to like you. All right, okay. But that's, yeah, I do think I quite like you too. Yeah, <laughs> or never um, seen before, but actually, I like your style. All right, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I do want to be liked. It's true, and um, and when I talk with people, I often feel a vulnerability as a kind of a human being trying to reach out to other human beings and will you or won't you engage with me. It's true. All of that is true. Mm -hmm. And I hear that lovely, please engage with me. Mm -hmm. that's, mm. that, 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 that's, that's very much what I'm uh, inviting. Um, um, uh, it, it, it's almost, for me, it's a, let's play. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things really, so thank you for your comments. It's reminding me of a, of a, of a, a conversation I, I had with a, a colleague, um, a, a, the academic director of a, of a program I work on at, at London Business School. Um, and uh, this particular cohort, this particular week I was working there, um, she would normally kick the program off. Uh, she couldn't make it, said, would you be willing to stand in for me to, to do that? Um, and I remember both feeling nervous and excited about it. And um, um, we, had, uh, we had a briefing call. The briefing call was fascinating for me because there was one statement she made in, the, in that call, which I thought was brilliant. She really said, this is how I want them to feel. And I just 
Yeah, you know, I, I thought that was, and, and she, you know, she went under, she talked about how she, like, you know, they're paying a lot of money to be there, they're traveling a long way to be there. You know, she said, I want them to feel a sense of excitement, almost a sense of awe about being there. Um, and, uh, and, but what the bit that got me was, this is what I want them to feel. And, and it's kind of a bit different. I wouldn't normally go there, but it's mm. really, it's, it taught me something about, you know, I would normally go with, this is what I want them to understand, or this is what I want them to think, or this is what I want, you know, I want to present something as clearly as possible and I want, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think she just went straight for the emotional connection. And wow, I, I brought my own twist to it as well, because I had been talking at a TA conference recently. I was having a chat with an old colleague of mine, Martin Wells, and he was telling me about something he'd been reading about belonging, about the importance of belonging. And, you know, I, I let, just I brought that idea in as well. I thought, you know, and what I said to them was literally I just say, you know, uh, you know, take a look around this awesome building, take a look at the Regent's Park across the road. Um, this, you know, I, I do hope you are feeling awed to be here, but I don't want you to feel overawed. I also want you to feel like you belong just because you're here in this room for no other reason, because you're here, you belong. Mm -hmm. And what was fascinating was uh, uh, the richness of the feedback that came back about exactly that, that feeling of belonging. Um, so I'm, uh, it's, it's live, it's a growing edge for me at the minute. It's something I'm absolutely uh, fascinated by. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think you're naming an edge that I'm really exploring at the minute. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Bina. Hi. Um, what came to my mind uh, as you were speaking, Graham, was uh, traditionally the word ulterior to me in my training and the work that I do is almost like either parent or a child, from parent to child ulterior. And yeah. what's interesting for me is that it's adult to adult ulterior. Yes. It's mm -hmm. a, so it's a very interesting concept, really, adult to adult ulterior. Yes. And then I, my mind went to, does the, the, the body language, uh, the terminology, the way we conduct ourselves, that comes into the adult and adult ulterior, just as it does in the parent ulterior or a child ulterior. Mm -hmm. am, I, am, I, am I getting yes. that right? Bang on. You are bang on in terms of how James and I are thinking about it and I've been mm. developing this uh, approach within CCTA, mm. yes. I, I also think that's what, you know, Novellino, that's what uh, Helena and Brian Fenton were talking, mm. you know, Helena Hargett and Brian Fenton were talking about as well, this whole idea of, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's whole dimensions in relating that are in, that at an, an implicit level. Yeah. Yeah. that are having an impact on us, a pro mm -hmm. probably the more profound impact, which is actually a little segue to Byrne's third rule of communication, that the, the, the behavioral outcome will be determined at the psychological mm -hmm. level. I mm -hmm. think that's true of adult, adult connecting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of that nonverbal material isn't under, most of the time is not under conscious control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because to me, when I'm working with clients, the body language is so important, you know, my body language, but also clients body language, because they might be making one statement or saying something, but if, they're, if it's uh, not congruent with their body, then yeah. mm -hmm. I kind of question, do they really mean that? Or is there something else going on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's always something else going on. <laughs> always. Yeah, always. Yeah. Always. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. James, did you want to say a little bit more about your thoughts there about lack somehow not being in conscious control? Well, it was only just to say there's, you know, there's so much work now within the neuroscience 
and within embodied cognitive science, where there's a greater understanding of just how much is that there's huge amount of processing that we do that is out of awareness and we just function, mm -hmm. you know, positively, automatically meeting our needs and, and living our lives. So, and a lot, and you know, we, we couldn't function if we had to attend to it consciously. Yeah. You know, we haven't got that amount of processing power. No, no, no. I was reading, reading a chapter by Mark Soames recently. He's a really interesting uh, mm. um, writer. He's a psychoanalyst and also a, a, a cognitive um, psychologist. Mm. And um, you know, he was talking about, well, you know, he's really saying, you know, the, the purpose of consciousness is to bring something to attention that we, we haven't figured out um, um, we, we, we haven't yet figured it out and learned how to do it automatically. So we need to bring consciousness to it. Um, and, you know, almost by design, like we actually have a relatively small working memory. Um, mm -hmm. And much of our memory is operating at an implicit pre-conscious level. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that excites me about this perspective is it's kind of, it's, again, it's, I think it's about expanding the, uh, the notion, the idea of what adult is. Mm. Um, and that I think it's, um, you know, that it's really saying it's not about conscious control, you know, mm. conscious awareness. It's, or it's not just about that. It is about that in part, but that's probably only a small part of it, actually. Mm. Um, certainly from this from this frame, taking these kind of contemporary mm. understandings of the implicit into account. Well, I think. Graham, you might... yes. hmm? I'm sorry, James. No, it's fine. Carry on. Just, uh, just as I've been listening to the conversation, something struck me. I mean, I'm at quite a rudimentary level of my journey of learning, but it this mysterious thing called physis that to me is just a mysterious word. It's it sounded to me as though in this room right now, people are trying to find language to to define it, to to stop it being almost a mystical thing, but a, a, something that can be defined and explained and put into language. Mm -hmm. That that inherent, I think if you if you gave us all enough time on on Earth, no matter how damaged we were, we would eventually be well. Um. Because because there's something inside us that that we're not even aware of that is able and is striving to be well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's a lovely way of thinking about that. And sometimes we feel connected to that in a very vivid and profound way. Whether we can describe it or not is another matter entirely. Um, and whether we can control it is probably even more of a, more of a stretch. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Absolutely. But, uh, I, you know, sometimes I, I kind of, I like to, I mean, I read a lot of psychology and, and a lot of textbooks, you know, but I kind of read them like poetry. That, that's what they are to me. You know, and when I read Daniel Stern and his work on, um, I love his work and his book, The Present Moment, uh, I just think it's a brilliant book and it's very dense. It's very mm. technical. It's very academic text. Mm. But for me, it's like reading poetry. It's kind of like there are just certain phrases that, <gasps> Mm. Yeah, just sort of lift you and take you different places and, and uh, um, so uh, I certainly hope that not explain away experience but perhaps more like the positive psychology so maybe you can savour it more mm. you know, sometimes the, 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 the poetry the words might help mm. yeah Graham I was um, struck I, I did read your, your paper again um, uh, I did my homework. <laughs> good, good. Well done, Rachel. <laughs> and, um, and one of the things that I was struck by reading it again was um, you, you quoting Daniel Stern uh, mm. and saying that actually sometimes, sometimes trying to put words to these implicit experiences mm. is not helpful. Um, that yeah, trying to do that too quickly can actually destroy the yes the moment that is created, and that really made sense to me with with, mm. so, with something that has has happened has happened with me with my teaching group this right. year that 
um, I knew I was being impacted by them as much as mm -hmm. I was impacting them and um, trying to trying to work out what it you know what what it was and um, and not being able to find the words for it and mm. in, interestingly that that's how I felt tonight I wanted to wanted to come in and wanted to talk but I just can't, can't find the words really mm. I'm, I'm <laughs> stumbling through as we talk now but I think there's there's something about the the uh interconnectedness as well of these this implicit um communication mm -hmm. that I'm I I teach I, I'm, I teach psychotherapy and um and I, I've really been teaching in a, in a co-creative way and coming to these workshops, there's been a kind of implicit, um, I've, been, I've been changed by the workshops. That's helped wow. me to, to change mm. the way that I teach and have an impact on my students and mm. they've had an impact on me. And it's just the kind of the, the never ending interconnectivity of us all. Uh, yes in that implicit way which I, I find really exciting and really moving oh it's beautiful yeah it is beautiful yeah i hope we never nail these processes in you know scientific terms yeah. <laughs> i hope they are forever free <laughs> but you know what you're describing is beautiful and it's that sense of um you know, sometimes when I think about the implicit, I don't think it's about, you know, we understand it so we can control it or so, mm. or, or even worse, so we can manipulate other people. Um, mm. uh, I think it's, it's more through an appreciation of the implicit. It's a bit like having a respect for how awesome it is. Yeah. Mm. You know, and how awesome it is to just feel yourself in this. Mm perhaps resonating with another human being or another group of human beings. Mm. It's quite profound. Yeah. Yeah, well, one thing that struck me in my own personal therapy is how often, you know, I can ch I change, but it's actually happened completely out of my awareness. There's been mm. no contract for it or anything like that, and I've suddenly noticed that I no longer respond in a certain way. I mm -hmm. respond very differently. Mm -hmm. And that's just been part of the, un, you know, there's been no words to it. And it's just as a consequence of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's evolved implicitly. Mm. Nicely put, James. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're working with your clients and you've kind of, <clears throat> there's stuff that's, going on in your head I have to be careful as not to say absolutely everything that's going on in my head I'm just learning that bit but um there's a yeah you'll have an idea of like oh, I wonder if the if my client will ever get here or be doing that or mm. be re re replying to it in this way or have this you know reaction to something or emotion and you're not actually specifically working on that mm -hmm. that's just something that kind of comes into your mind and then they come into the session and then they start to say that the changes have been happening and things that they've been doing, but mm -hmm. we've not worked on it specifically. Mm -hmm. And it's not ever been actually said, like, mm. you know, it would be a good idea to kind of cut contact with your brother because he's not treating you very well. So, you know, it's something like that. Mm. But they come into that themselves, even though the work's not even about that. But sometimes I have that feeling that mm -hmm. I wonder if, and yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's really powerful. Mm. And it's 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 a bit like you're holding someone in mind mm. and wondering about them, wondering about their life and wondering about their possibilities. That's something mm. that you're bringing to the relationship. Mm. I was just thinking, jumping on the back of what Claire said, it's one of my favourite things at the moment with working with clients is when they begin new relationships themselves. So it's like our relationship has had such an impact on them and they've taken mm. new bits and grown those and they go find other people to connect with. So mm -hmm. the ripple effect is happening between me and them and then them and another person. Yeah. It's just so lovely. And just to see them 
grow in that as well in another mm -hmm. relationship yeah. it's fabulous yeah ripple effect mm. i i i um I was struck by what you were saying james there about you know i know i've i know i've changed at some level and that mm. it's it's not be, i've not been consciously trying to mm. perhaps you know um I've just been in a in a relationship that's resonating with me in some way, and and something in me is shifting, and it's certainly how, um, certainly how Daniel Stern and his Boston Change mm -hmm. psychotherapy group they they talk about about these implicit processes as being the point mm -hmm. of therapy. Like the point of therapy mm -hmm. is to is to have a shift in your implicit experience. Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not you make it conscious, or to what extent, you know, it's like mm. it might come into it, but it doesn't have to. No, that's right. It doesn't. Mm. Yeah. And maybe you know, there's some perhaps contrast with, with perhaps with how we might have been trained or what we've learned about, um, you know, making conscious redecisions in the here and now. Well, mm. maybe so we make non-conscious redecisions in the here and now as well maybe they're the one most important ones yeah possibly and maybe there's something quite cultural for us about overvaluing consciousness and, and rationality. over overvaluing the rational yeah. yes yeah. yes and actually not you know giving a voice well not so much giving a voice but an acknowledgement of the, of the impact of the implicit within our lives mm -hmm that we're more than what we think and consciously feel perhaps. Yeah. Can I share, I hope it's a, it, it won't, um, I'm talking about a client, but I won't obviously identify them. But yeah, and if you can anonymize as you speak yeah, as absolutely. well. It's more about the process, but okay. it's just really reminded me of this situation I had this week. We come to the end of the session and we were saying the goodbye things and neither of us moved and she was just looking at me and we just stayed there in silence looking into each other's eyes because our our left brain if you like had finished the session mm -hmm. but we weren't <laughs> done yet <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant and it was so lovely it was so yummy that bit and i think yeah. i felt afterwards that was probably the most important 10 seconds of the entire hour that's so wonderful. you know yeah. that's wonderful yeah. There's something really important in the pleasure of that. Mm. And it's interesting how some of those intimate experiences are um, they're not planned. Mm. You know, they're almost improvised and you know, like who would have thought you might have connected in that way? It's like who knew? But but there was you know, um, th there was a way in which I, what I'm hearing is you, you, you surrendered to the moment and you entered into that moment. Mm -hmm. Lovely. I, I have a couple of questions, if, if I may ask. Please. Um, <laughs> I, my mind went to a couple of places as I was listening. And the first one was the first place it went to. Um, am I right in thinking? Because this is all new to me still. Am I right in thinking that the core creative way of working happens over a number of sessions rather than right from the beginning? Because right at the beginning with clients, I guess it's about unfolding their script you know, them talking about their experiences. Mm. Um, but I guess as time goes on, the co-creative way of working, relational way of working, all starts to fall in place. So I'm kind of thinking, is would this co-creative way of working on, be on a long-term basis once you've established that relationship, once you, you know, work, got the working alliance there? Or would you say, in your experience, would you say it's right from the beginning? Great question. I, I wonder if it's more of a question to um, psychotherapists. Um, 
Uh, uh, James, you might have yeah. some reflections, but other yeah, people may have as well. I mean, I'll just yeah, be sure. really interested to. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's there from the start. And, you know, one of the principles of co creative relating is present centered relating. And I think when we engage with our clients in non defensively from adults in the here and now, I think it starts from there. Now, of course, we can't make it co-creative, but as we were talking earlier about what was going on in this session and what enables people to participate and be present. And I think it's that aspect of inviting the other to be non-defensively present and join, join in and, and feel they don't need to defend. So I don't see it quite the way you were describing it, but, you know, I'm sure Graham will have a view on that as well, and others of you will as, in addition. So I'm interested in what others would say about I, it. I think we, for me, I think I need to find something to love about the person straight away, mm -hmm. to have the intention to... Um, yeah, to find a way of, 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 of loving them. I don't know if, if that makes sense to people. I think that's what Amanda was talking about when you were talking about that moment you had with your client. Um, intimacy uh, is another aspect of the love. Mm. But uh, in a, it's, a, it's more an attitude, I think. Mm. But I, 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 I tend to kind of think about it in the way you do, James, it, it's right from the moment. And also I'm thinking that, I think we kind of, kind of we, we can overthink this. Mm. Um, every moment is ephemeral, ephemeral. You know, I'm not the same person today as I was yesterday and will be tomorrow. And I'm not the same person as I was when I started practicing nearly 20 years ago. Um, and my clients aren't the same. Every time they walk in the room, it's a whole new story, mm. I think. Even though the actual story might be the same, the, mm. the story in the moment is, is, is different. So it's always exciting. And I have a lot of fun, um, I think, with my clients. I'm very playful, which reminds me why I, I tuned into this, because I've I know you a little bit, Graham, and I've, I don't know you, James, so it is mm. to say, no no grain more and I, I I really like your playfulness and your vitality mm. and your fun and um, I think play is incredibly important in therapy mm. I think we played together at a conference dinner table was that we did a long time ago yes ages we ago did. I remember Stevenson was there there's a bunch of us around I it was the that. world it was the um, the world one in Edinburgh. Yes, yes. A long yes, time ago. Yes, I yeah, remember. very long yeah, time yeah. ago. Yeah, very good. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think I take a lot of risks, really, as a therapist. Which I, I I'm I'm careful, but I also take a lot of risks. Yes. Um, and what I'm, what I'm and what I'm what I'm enjoying, Karen, is is. Um, uh, it, it's a bit like your distilling experience, you know, over the years, and and and, and you know, perhaps you do have some words for oh, what's this about? You know, it's about mm -hmm. showing up. It's about yeah, about being excited about this new moment that's mm. going to happen between these new mm. versions of both of us. Yeah, um, exactly. It's about yeah. finding something to love. Yeah. Um, it's about mm. taking risks and taking care. Like you, mm. it's like you know, it's a bit like your. These are some of your principles that you've been formulating over years. They are years. my principles very much, and I, 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 I re I mean, this is just the way I work, and I, I'm, I definitely model them because I definitely live them, and I am exactly the same person outside of the therapy room as I am in it. I don't have a, a mm. kind of therapy persona. I fidget. I take my shoes on and off. Um, you know, I often work outdoors with clients, the ones who like to do that. Uh, I've had some intensely moving sessions with clients when just un things you can't expect to happen happen because you're outdoors. Mm -hmm. 
mm. you know, um, like an interaction with someone's dog or a stranger saying something or, yeah. And they are incredibly, um, oh gosh, so existential really. Um, they're just moments that are very important, but then that moment passes and there's another moment. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm making any sense to anybody at all. Well, you're doing what we, we kind of said we might do, you know, which was, we're going to play with words here. Jumble about, yeah. Let's make a marvellous mess together, mm. you know? Mm. And, um, <laughs> and, you know, and perhaps every one of us walks away feeling moved in a slightly different way mm. that we, we, we would have done if we hadn't been in the mm. conversation and yeah. perhaps perhaps encouraged to kind of you know to keep exploring and mm. um resonating in what what's meaningful joyful for us um and perhaps playing with words that enhance that process mm. who knows you might even pull it into a treatment plan i don't know what you might do with it but you know mm. but that's the, mm. there is it's one of the things I like about these things as well. You don't mm. know what's going to happen. You just no. don't know <clears throat> what's going to emerge in the conversation, where we'll be pushing and pulling each other and where we'll end up. For me, I love that. I find it very exciting. Yeah. Mm. And, and it, it's such a non-scripty way of being, inviting possibilities, inviting mm. something to emerge in the here and now. Can I share something with you briefly, just a, a thing that happened? I just want to share it. So if we're going with, you know. Um, so I have a client who's, um, she has a quite a serious mood disorder and um, very nervous of life. And we go for walks mm -hmm. because she um, is quite scared to go on her own. I took her for a walk, we went into the woods and I suggested we go down um, a bank. She knew, you know, what I was, what I was thinking of. But then she got scared at going down this slope. So I thought, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with her? Um, and the only way I could help her was to put my hand out and help her. And um, and then a woman came by and said, "Are you are you all right, you two? It was so lovely. And we both said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're fine. Thank you. And that session, which happened totally spontaneously in the moment, was so, so important. It gave us both so much information about her. Mm. And um, the hardest thing for her was to really accept that she needed me to help her. Mm -hmm. And that I was actually OK. I didn't need her to look after me. Mm. But it was really enacted quite naturally yes. because we were out in the environment it was so so interesting i'm just sharing that with you yeah yes like an experience could happen because almost circumstantial and then yeah. there's the witness you know serendipity like you could plan, life. um yeah. element, but there's some way of of actually the openness to that being a learning experience yeah that, 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 you, that and, and you to some extent a lot of that is just is negotiated through. I mean, not like not consciously negotiated. Yeah. Like we're working it out, you know, with our yeah. bodies almost. You know how to be together, totally how to regulate mm. feelings, and a lot of that is just happening mm. almost at a, at a body le level. Um, and you could say there are ul ul ulteriors there, but they are yes. totally yeah. not thought. They're not kind of oh, no. like no. robotic. I know what I'm going to do this now. You know, yeah. it's like okay, um, mm. let's just. Let's just work it out together. Yes, it's and it's like, it's like um, the way I think about co-regulation. It's a bit like you know, there's a um, there's an unconscious, non-conscious um, intelligence at work. Oh, totally. You know, yeah. That's happening, yeah. and it's happening yeah. at a different level entirely mm -hmm. to what we're trying to figure out mm -hmm. cognitively. So, and, and, mm -hmm. yeah. um, what what I'm enjoying about the conversation is just acknowledging that as. Actually, that's pretty normal. Yeah. That's that's everyday life. It's everyday yeah. life. Everyday yeah. life. Um, yeah. And um, uh, we don't have to cognitively analyze everything. And yeah, you said that, you know, we don't have to overthink it. You know, I think that's the point is that part of what we're, part of what I'm kind of suggesting is 
this mm. hey there's this implicit level of life that's going on mm. that we're experiencing <clears throat> and contributing to um that is part of our dance with the world and dance with other people and uh, or, or, mm -hmm. you know and has all this going and, mm -hmm. and for me it, the, the point is not to be analyzing it mm. it's more to be respecting it and appreciating it and savoring it when it's when that's working for and almost delighting in how clever it is yeah. <laughs> um that sort of thing um and and of course there are times when we might you know we 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 come against something that's painful or problematic or repetitious in a way mm. you might need to give it more cog you know cognitive attention mm. um yeah i find what's really good about this conversation for me is 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 it kind of is modeling i've never had any clients i, I haven't done any placement yet mm -hmm. and from my own experience of myself in therapy and other people who I've known who go to therapy, there's an there's a there's a trepidation of of the negative that that will be brought to the room that that mm. I'm here to hopefully help with. Um, but this conversation tonight is when I mentioned before about trying to find the language. Maybe it isn't trying to find the language. It's just trying to find the the heartfelt knowledge of hey we can we can still be light and mm -hmm. and healing is happening without me recognizing it just my presence being here with this person mm -hmm. them being here with me with the work is happening that that's so powerful and and, and i feel that in this room tonight that's that's mm -hmm. being brought to me mm -hmm. wow yeah i find that very touching because personally i i even though i now we've been all doing this for two or three years getting on. I, I still find um, this way of being in a room with people very strange. So <laughs> that's lovely you say that, Mary. Mm, yeah. Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. And it, it shifts in a way the work from about what we do to how we are as a way mm. of being in relationship. And it changes that. I think when I first came to TA, having been trained as a person-centered therapist, I found there was just so much doing going on that it really jarred with me. Because my focus has always been on, you know, how am I with my clients? What's my way of being? And mm. wanting to focus on that. And it is quite in co-creative TA. There is a there is a movement focusing on the client and what the client is up to, and my way of being with that. So, James, that what you've just said really resonate resonated with me. I had a I had a session. Well, I've been seeing a couple for six sessions now, mm -hmm. and the work has been about betrayal. And the conflict that has been caused in the relationship of mm. this particular couple. Mm. And today was, was our fifth session, and it had to happen on Zoom because one of the members of the couple had COVID. Mm. So it was really interesting that we had a session on Zoom, and their uh, speaker didn't work properly. So I kind of thought, oh my goodness, what's my role going to be? They're not going to be able to hear me. You know, yeah. what's going to happen to the session? Am yeah. I going to be an awful therapist? You know, all those sort of oh, things. Oh gosh, okay. And then yeah. the most interesting thing happened that because I couldn't hear them properly, it mm. was such a magical thing that happened that they were talking to each other on Zoom. And uh -huh. I took the back seat. <laughs> brilliant, wow. brilliant, brilliant, <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> brilliant. So then, that was a co creative way of working. Yeah. With uh, and, um, um, oh, by the way, I just want to make a side comment. I want to come back. I love your story. Uh, Rachel, you made reference to us taking a break soon. So uh, I, I think, um, Rachel Cook, uh, so I think, yes, we will. Um, but maybe uh, we just 
finish off kind of responding to your story, Bina, and then then we'll take a break and, and mm. co come back to this. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, lovely story. Mm. Lovely story. In, in our book um, uh, on co-creative TA, uh, Helena writes about the third. Mm. You know, and part of what she's writing about is that kind of serendipity. You know how something, you know, it wasn't planned, but but actually something happened and something came out of that that wouldn't have happened if the you know if the accident hadn't happened or, yeah um, and um, i don't know if it would have happened if uh, i was seeing them face to face maybe it happened the opportunity of not yeah, being able to hear yeah, properly because yeah. of the sound not working yeah. it gave them the opportunity to be together and touch each other and make contact with each other yeah and how awesome that they took it it's a bit like they'd already made the time and, yeah. you know but wow amazing but i feel i feel much better now knowing what co-creative works <laughs> it, it's interesting i mean I, I suppose i think of co-creative ta as a way of looking or a yeah. way of being rather than oh you know if you're working at, this is what you do when you do x y and z and it just doesn't mm. really fit that frame for me in fact i'm, I'm rather resistant to kind of pinning it down in terms of a methodology because I think people you know people connect in all sorts of different ways in all sorts of different contexts it's kind of like um I, I just don't want to pin it down to a methodology but, but but perhaps more of a philosophical outlook and more of a way of thinking and um uh and there probably are ways you could say oh this might be what co-creative TA might look like in practice, but even then I'm a little bit hesitant from defining something just mm. in case it gets turned into a robotic kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, formula. And it's also something about acknowledging that we were born to be in contact with each other. Mm. And, and perhaps to be constantly improvising. Yeah. You know, and, that, that, and there's something about the improvisation that happens in life. And I think your story is about that, Bina. I think your story is about that as well, Karen. Is mm. like, you're open to something happening that's improvised in the moment. And we kind of, mm. and if you like, we surrender to it. And your story, Amanda, I thought was lovely as well. Okay, uh, you know, left brain has uh, finished the session, but the right brain still wants to hang out, play for a few more seconds there, you know, and engage. Yeah. Um, I like that word improvisation. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I am going to suggest we do take a break. Yeah. Um, uh, it is five to seven. Yeah. How long do you want? <laughs> 10 minutes, 15 minutes longer? 10? Ten. 10's one bid. 10. People okay with 10? 10, that seems to be going down well. Ten, 10 looks to be going down. Let's Let's meet up again. Uh, don't disconnect from the call. Just turn your camera off or your mute your sound, whatever. And we'll come back in at five past uh, seven UK time. Cool. See you. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Marvellous. <laughs> Good catch. Um, mm. Okay. Some of you may be familiar with this idea if you're familiar with co-creative TA. For others, it might just be, well, that's not what I was taught. Um, that's fine. Whatever your reaction is, I just want to say this is how it makes sense to, to us for the co-creative frame. Um, Byrne talked about ego states in two very different ways, often seen as quite contradictory. Um, so um, one story that he had was that... Um, all of the ego states are valuable, um, uh, all make a valuable contribution to life. Um, and um, mm. if you like, therapy is about healing the, 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 the stuck bits in our parent and child, if you like, so we can access the, the rest as, as resources. And I think that's, you know, it's a, and that's probably the dominant story in TA. He also had another story about ego states, which was that, you know, the, 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 the child is a warped ego state, fixated in response to trauma. Um, uh, and, um, you know, and the, and the parent that is the parent is kind of created at the same time. Um, 
uh, it's almost as though we try to manage uh, a, a relationship, an attachment relationship is important to us, but for whatever reason, it doesn't feel safe to be some aspect of ourselves in that relationship. And we, we deal with that, um, that um, lack of receptiveness in the relationship by splitting ourselves, by kind of splitting up for these, this interjected parent and this archaic child, both fixated. There's one story that Byrne talks about of, um, uh, of a, a boy approaching his mum as she's getting out of the bath and approaches her with some sexual curiosity. Um, and she's horrified. She just recoils in horror. And, and, and his reflection on that, you know, and his response to that is just to kind of pull away. Mm. Um, uh, but he, he talks about that experience for that, child uh, you know is, is, is really saying that's when the child ego state was born this is the birth of the trauma is the birth of the child ego state so that's another story and that's kind of the story that we picked up on and developed co-creative ta so within that frame we would see adult as being our resourceful and integrating sense of self and the bits that are traumatized we'd see as as as, uh, as the parent and child bits of ourselves that we've had to split off because the relationship couldn't handle um, what, all of us. Um, uh, so I'm sharing this with you because it's a way of thinking about the, the next diagram doesn't make any sense unless you really get this is where we're coming from and this is how we see it. Um, so let me move into the next diagram. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do Ah, it works, it works, but that's not what I wanted to go, was it? No, I've skipped a diagram. Come back. Yes, that's what I wanted to share with you. So for those of you who didn't read my article, this is what, this was the main idea. <laughs> and it's the notion, it's, it's kind of trying try to put, pictures and words to what we've been talking about. Um, um, when Helena and, uh, you know, Hagen and Fenton and Novellino talk about, uh, before those opening quotes about the unconscious, that's, that I think they're really talking about the implicit psychological level. But what they're not doing is they're not making any distinction between the different kinds of um, implicit level. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, they use the terms non-conscious and unconscious interchangeably, as do a lot of um, psychoanalytic writers. Mm -hmm. um, what I've picked up on here is an idea that came from Daniel Stern in his book, The Present Moment, where he's really saying they reserve the way they do it, the way they think about it. They reserve the term unconscious for, for um, our defensiveness. You know, like what we've um, pushed out of awareness or pushed out of relationship because it's been too difficult to bear. Mm -hmm. um, but retain the, the notion of non-conscious, meaning all of that implicit, good enough sense of self, sense of being with others that we can savor in just the ways that we've been talking about before the tea break. So I really like that. I think that's a neat distinction. Um, mm -hmm. That, and, and, and for me, what it does is it helps uh, put words to what I've often, what I've always thought about adult ego state, um, which is that it's far more than consciousness. Consciousness is just one bit of it. Hmm. The way Byrne defines adult is it's kind of sets of feelings, attitudes and behaviors adapted to the here and now. Adapted doesn't mean necessarily consciously adapted. You know, we've talked about lots of ways in which we co-regulate our space some of which would be in awareness a lot of it is not and a lot of it is improvised in the moment it's not even we could have planned it because it just happened so intuitively um, and yet it works and that's the way a lot of our good enough relationships work there's a there's this co-regulation going on at this non-conscious level that is part of the marvelous mess of being alive and being vital in that space um, so this is, this is the idea at an, at an ego state level. Mm. Um, 
One more diagram I'm going to share with you, and then we'll just get some of your thoughts and reflections just by way of pulling it together. So um, the next bit, slide. Ta -da! So then we begin to put this into transactions. And, and this, Keith and I, as I say, we, we drew this adult, adult ulterior transaction in, in, a, in an accessible paper, although we refer to the ideas elsewhere. Um, and this notion that in adult, adult, you know, we, we partly we have conscious intent and we do things on purpose and we think and we name things and do all those explicit bits. Um, but also there's this undercurrent, there's this undercurrent of non-conscious implicit communication that, you know, and if we're maintaining that adult, adult is, is, lubricating that relationship the whole time it's like it's how we it's it's um stern has a lovely way he talks about ways of being with others you know ways of being with another and and which is why i really liked your reference james to there was something about the relationship that touched me that has an impact on me um and we and you know maybe you don't even have words for it never mind talk about it but that that will be happening um, in a good enough relationship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I want to follow up, just one last point, I want to follow up with a um, uh, reflection from Stern. So he, in his book, is commenting on a clinical vignette in which a therapeutic rupture between therapist and client has just been successfully navigated. In other words, you've had the rupture, you've had the, you know, the transferential reenactment, you found a way back to each other in the, in the here and now. He's, he talks like this. They are both learning implicitly that together they can work this kind of situation out. They are co-creating ways of being with one another. In short, they are implicitly learning ways of regulating their intersubjective field. This delicate choreography goes on mostly outside of consciousness. Mm. And he's referring to the therapist as well as the client, making that point. Mm. So there we are. I wanted to just give you a few diagrams, put it into a, a TA frame that may be familiar in some ways, may be unfamiliar in others, but it's certainly, it's, it's our uh, in, uh, attempt to really broaden, expand this notion of adult way beyond consciousness, awareness, choices, the cognitive thing. It's way beyond that, the way, certainly the way we, we think about it. So, curious, your reactions, thoughts, associations, marvelous messy connections you might be making maybe it's jarring with something that you already know maybe it's kind of it's encouraging something you're interested in what, what, what whatever tell, tell me your your thoughts and feelings if you want to yeah i'd like to um chip in um i've been working intensively for the last couple of years now with with trauma and um in, in very short interventions as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I was coming to this um, thinking that maybe I've wandered a bit far away from uh, the theory about how to do therapy, um, certainly how to do longer therapies. Um, but actually I'm really liking this because mm. it feels like what's been going on anyway, largely right. for me. Um, I really like it. I'm going to have to read more about it. Mm, Thank mm. you. And can you name what the resonance is, Marie? Like, what, what, what are you finding in it, or what is it speaking to in your experience? I think permission, you know, to um, to to not have to slavishly follow. Uh, I mean, you can read Burn. I, I I love Burn too, but you can read him as being very prescriptive. Yes. Um, and this is. Not. <laughs> no. I really like that about it. Right. Um, it's much more human. Yes. Um, and I'm sure that if Burn was around now, he would like it too. I'm sure Burn's brain would be on fire if he was around now, because we have a lot more 
<laughs> you know, the guy was really smart and he was very well read and he was very curious. I'm sure, you know, he'd, he'd be playing in all sorts of different directions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. Would it be worth stopping the screen share? Actually, before we do that, I, I think I obviously lied because there's one more slide I do want to show you. I'm sorry, I just that's all right. Because because I think it's partly it speaks to what Maria has just been talking about. Um, it's not that one. That's just another way of thinking about intersubjective fields. Ah, this is the one I want to show you. So this is another way in which I, it's the way I've been playing with this more recently. You know, I kind of tend to use this color coding, you know, as, as, as um, blue is for adult, um, red for the fixated parent and child fields. And, and I, I, so I'm, I'm always looking, uh, and I, I very much, uh, you know, resonate with you there, Karen. I'm looking, when I build theory, play with words and ideas and theory. And, 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 the volume's gone very low, Graham. When I play with theory, one of the things I'm really often interested in, can you hear me now? Yeah. Is um, how, how can this theory be as simple as possible and as complex as necessary? Um, You're very quiet, Graham. I'll turn it up again. Try again. Can you hear me now? Is that yeah. better? Yeah, okay, a lot better. Really. So, you know, I'm really interested. In, and, um, and partly, I think that was what Byrne was interested in. I think he was trying to make these complex psychological ideas accessible. And I think that's the root of TA theory. Um, so where I've got to is really distilling it down to these two loops. Um, and um, it, Sue used in my partner and fellow TA colleague, and I have been very busy with th this uh, uh, w way of conceptualizing relationship. Um, so the way I think about it, the blue loop is all, is that implicit level, largely informed by the implicit level relationship that creates the psychological safety, that creates the, emer the, the space within which um, not just the client, but even but us as a practitioner can emerge. So there's more we're making a real, we're co-creating this relational field in which means that we can find new and interesting ways of being together, to use your term there, James. Um, and, and of course, there will still be the red bits, you know, <laughs> the fixated parent and, and, and child. Um, and we've created those in response to often in to trauma, times when we feel felt hurt or um, uh, um, or um, negated in some way, where there's pain, there's pain, there's anger, there's fear, there's a lot of perhaps the intense dramatic feelings we talked about earlier on. Um, but the way I think about it is, how do we create a blue loop together that's big enough, that holds us both, so we can then look at some of the the, the, the tricky stuff, the painful stuff that's still still stuck, still, st we know we're still hurting, we're still defending fiercely perhaps um, a, a, against someone not doing that to us again. Um, so, and, and so I'm putting this into a context of really suggesting that since none of us is perfect, we will all have some red, we're all gonna have some of those sticky bits. Um, um, the aim is not to get rid of that entirely. We won't, um, but but we can get more skilled at creating conditions and relationship, which which um, gives us the possibility of of revisiting some of those experiences and, and hopefully transforming defenses into something uh, into a more open way of being with each other that can contain more emotional range. Mm. That's the bit I want to finish on, and I. I will stop there and I'll turn the, turn the thing off so we can have uh, some uh, conversation. Mm. So thanks for the nudge there, Marie. I think that, that's, you know, I just want to make the connection. This is not huggy, tree hugging, you know, let's just be nice to each other. It's a, it's a really, uh, uh, the way I think about it, it's the prerequisite for actually doing any stuff to do with trauma. It's about creating the, the field conditions that, that can allow that to happen mm. safely. Yeah, yeah. Well, just additional on that, because you and I were talking about this earlier, 
about one foot in and one foot out. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting. Did you want to say something about it? You want me to say something? No, about I want it? you to say something. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was uh, you and actually, Sue's idea, this, I think. This is a metaphor that Sue came up with for thinking about precisely this thing that, you know, that actually when you're in relationship, um, uh, I guess any relationship, but, you know, I mean, I think about it in terms of therapy, but it's probably true in any relationship. Mm. You know, when we have, you know, when we, when we have a rupture, and, and that's usually because our something fixated or some parent or child element has got stimulated probably in both of us. Um, how, do we con- how do we contain that? And what, what do we do in those moments? And Sue has this lovely idea of having one foot in the transference or the co-transference and one foot out. And if you and your client can have one foot in and one foot out, mm. that gives you a chance of really... Um, mm acknowledging the flare up or the, the enactment whatever you might call it um, and approaching it with care with curiosity possibly with playfulness you know like whatever helps but somehow gives you the the conditions so i love the one foot in one foot out thing yeah. i think that's great and and it's a nice way of accounting for um uh you know what gets stirred in us when a client gets stirred you know, there's the co-transference. Yeah. Graham, can I share? It's really spoken to me. You know, when you get in the bath and it's too hot, mm. but you don't need to get out completely. You just need one leg out to cool you off, and the other one needs to keep an eye on the temperature. Yes. <laughs> yes. Cool. <laughs> That's That's brilliant. Brilliant. So one foot in the bath, one foot out. And the one yeah, in the bath like... uncomfortable. But it's all right. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> I love I love the playing with metaphors. Yeah. What else? What else is associations, connections? You've got me thinking about both of us having one foot in and one foot out because I think ah. Sue Sue writes about us as therapists having ah. one in and one foot out, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but that's my understanding. You you probably understand her a bit more than I do. <laughs> uh, might be maybe it might be it might be a um um uh i i don't know i'd, I'd have to read sue more closely with that question in mind it's a really interesting well I, i'm pretty sure that she she writes it about us as therapists all right okay. one foot in and one foot out yes. um but i'm 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 interested in what your and and i guess the thing is is uh that you know part of us part of us allows us uh, allows us to get lost in the transference with our client and the other uh, the other part stays yes stays out and supervision can help us stay out yes and, and get out so i'm i'm really interested in that what you said in terms of if we can both have one foot in and one foot out um, that's pa- then that's powerful then that is even well, more powerful I, I'm 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 just it's got me thinking about well what does that look like for the client because in a sense I, I kind of think about we get into an enactment because of our you know our process as a therapist as well as our client um but it's it's often because often not always but often because we've got a a, a more expanded integrating adult uh, than our client that that we can keep uh one foot out and and hold in mind what's been happening sure. between us. so I, I but but I I have had experiences of of the client doing that um for, before I do yes uh, me yeah. too me too yeah. and I and, I, and mm. I, we even refer to that as, a, as you know as, as something that happens you know in, in uh so so um so I, I, absolutely, it can be, you know, you can be blind to the co-transference and your, and your client points it out. Mm. Yeah. I got a story of my daughter when she was about six, having an argument with her mum. And they were both furious with each other. And uh, it was my daughter who said, we're not getting anywhere, are we, mummy? Because <laughs> you, think, you think I make you cross and I think you make me cross. <laughs> She just nailed it. She nailed it. Her mother was gobsmacked, you know, and she was the trained psychiatric nurse, you know, with loads of, yeah. So, um, yeah, clients will do that for us too. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, Linda, I can hear, see your mouth moving and you're, you're on mute. Mouth opening like a fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm thinking of what happens in those unfortunate cases where the therapist is in the bath and the client is in the bath, mm -hmm. to use uh, Amanda's lovely metaphor of, of, of the bath there. Um, and, and there's no one around to get them out. Like mm -hmm. the, you know, because, because one, the, the therapist is, yes, talking to her supervisor, but very much talking to her supervisor in the terms of, um, through the filter of her transference, Mm -hmm. So, you mm -hmm. know, expressing the traumatized parts of herself, but not realizing that's what she's doing, and the and the supervisor not necessarily realizing that that's sure. What she's doing. Um, and and uh, the supervisor, as the person outside of the bath, is only seeing that it's the therapist that's struggling in there and forgets forgets that actually there are two people in this bar who cannot get out yeah and it's like the therapist has got the supervisor's got into the bath as well it's, yeah. a, it's overflowing this bath isn't it yeah yes. absolutely. got that exactly graham it's like now we've got three in the bloody bar yes exactly what do we do then what do we do then and who knows because it's like the 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 uh therapy is is has her own uh, version of how they both got in this bath and what it means for her and then with the the uh, therapist who's in a in the bath right up to her neck and she's only relating um the defensive parts of herself yes and how does the supervisor know how do we know this whole, the whole thing you're talking about here has been the subject of my wonderful partner, Sue Euston. Her doctoral research has been oh. looking at um, um, therapists' experience of, of um, needing help and asking for it. Oh, wow. It's, it, it, I mean, it's, been, it's very rich research. It's been fascinating. And um and you know it, it kind of there are there are phrases like um you know she, she asks when is it hardest to ask for help and you know some of the phrases that comes up repeatedly is when i need it most mm -hmm. so it's when i might and and so it's a lovely distinction it's when i might go to supervision but i don't use it yes mm -hmm. yeah. or, or, I, or I, I i somehow restrict it so much i'm not really bringing my vulnerability yeah. to them yeah. Absolutely, and and the supervisor is sometimes completely blinded by this. Yes, uh, and so then what we end up with is that the water runs out of the bath. I love that that metaphor, Amanda. I'm, I'm seeing it now. You know, it's like they the the they the bath is empty and. Now we've got two people who absolutely believe that their position in terms of sitting there naked um, is the right one, mm -hmm. that that other person's position mm -hmm. is absolutely the wrong one. Mm -hmm. and, and I have some mm -hmm. personal experience of this, not as a supervisor, not as a um, not as a well it, it doesn't it doesn't I, I can't uh, tell you any circumstances around it no, fine I, I think it's really important that you're respecting yeah. you know the confidentiality this deserves so. yeah so, so it's a situation where I can clearly see that the the yeah, they're all in this bloody muck together and there's soap bubbles going everywhere and there's no water to wash them off. And it, and it, somebody to come in and just like pour cold water over both of them in mm. order to 
that them out of this this defensive position. Yes. It's and, and, and what you might be pointing to, you know, might might, might also be part of the problem, mm. is the bigger um, uh, kind of systemic field, um, even the theory, or you know, maybe there's something almost rigidly cult-like about the the the, the um, you know the, the 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 training, which you know it's it, you know th this is the way, this is the right way, and if someone's not cooperating with that then they're being resistant or, you know blah 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 yeah. there are all sorts of yeah. we could probably all have talk about you know examples of that but yeah. what you i think what you are pointing to is a sort of you know there's a fixed mindset there somewhere that's mm. getting in the way of actually mm. the yeah. uh, making a safe space for the vulnerability you know to yeah. to, to emerge and, and the, you know the vulnerability that is in the it's, it's vulnerable be just being a human being with other human beings like you know because nothing's certain and um but you know how that gets amplified especially if you're working with with, with, with trauma as well yeah and there's something also about hoping at some point one or other will become very curious about what is actually happening mm. you know how come we're in this terrible state or even just is there another way to look at this? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's like it's not like you know what I'm doing is wrong. It's just like well, maybe it's not the only way, and maybe it's mm. not not the not the not the best way. Maybe it's unhelpful. Maybe it's cruel. You know, maybe it's unethical. But it's kind of, mm. but but mm. the, to be exploring, holding different frames of reference, and uh, yeah, um, you yeah. know, I'm always so much more interested in what my supervisee is not telling me. Uh -huh. I don't want to come, her to come in and tell me what she wants to tell me, unless in Ian Stewart's terms, we're bragging about something that's gone really well, mm -hmm. in which case I welcome that with open arms. But, but I don't, I don't, it's like that shadow side of my supervisee is where my um, yes. interest is. Yes. And it's like we have to get away, we have to get off the trap of thinking we're a good therapist, because that's a trap. As soon as we think, you know, get over invested in being a good therapist, that's when we seal off the blind spots. Yeah. So, so my, my seeking is to find the supervisor that really questions me about what is going on for me mm. when I'm sitting with this supervisee or this mm -hmm. yeah like what am I not telling her what am I too ashamed to tell her about yes is much more of a um and what I what I find is that uh, uh supervisors are often mm, too quick to um too quick to believe what their supervisee is telling them right mm. i hate to say that because i know that none of us want to lie but none of us either want our supervisor to see that actually we still have those defenses and we're using them mm -hmm. in our yes at an unconscious level but we're using them mm. and to somehow work with you know the supervisee to create those conditions where this can be normal this, this can be mm. part as part of mm. our conversation um, yeah. and to dare to go to those edges of vulnerability but we need but you know we can't do that without building that psychological safety to do it mm. yeah mm. thank you for bringing the ethical edges of um, what we're discussing into the conversation, Linda. Mm. I, I feel really passionate about. I can hear. Mm. Mm. I can hear. What else? What else is in your 
head and heart. Dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a I'm a true mammal. <laughs> thinking about my bodily needs. Mm. And it's been great. Thank. Sorry, Amanda. Just been uh, really good because I'm gonna I'm gonna go in a minute when Google tells me my dinner in the oven is ready. Well, before you dash off, then Karen, what would you like to say? Share with us or say it to us before before you go? Um, organically. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for all being you. And um, I'll just I'll just say one thing on the back of the bath metaphor, which is I always I think about it as uh, I think it was Adrian Lee that said it a long time ago in some couples uh, training I did with her a long time ago, and it was something like how can I be and it's something I say to clients a lot or encourage them to say to each other to be curious, always have a curiosity question mark in the room, like literally, like the shape with a question mark shape which is how can I be close to you but still be myself and keep myself so it mm. really is that mm. fundamental mm. I mean it's so human you know we talk about personality disorder I mean fuck's sake you know it's just part of being human mm -hmm. how how can we be close and how can we be distant and where do we find the moment the edge and mm. I sometimes actually do it with clients in the room we stand up and we find the edge of where it feels too close or too far mm -hmm. um so i think about the bath in that way it's a similar idea as one foot in one foot out mm -hmm. um and, and uh, um, your dinner in the oven is another way my dinner in the <laughs> say, hey yeah well, it hasn't well, it hasn't pinged yet but thank <laughs> you very much i'm 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 going to be a good girl and wait for um Google to tell me. Right. But thank you. Thank you, Karen. Well, can I ask a, um, a sort of a technical question? Because you yep. were talking about the diagrams. So um, James is one of my supervisors. Of course, I never do this. But you know, sometimes if you're with the supervisor and you're sort of manipulating the situation. And at the beginning, I some, did. Some people do that. I did that. <laughs> I don't, he wouldn't let me get away with it anymore. But, um, I, but very consciously thinking, how can I get, how can I get out of here okay, essentially? How can I manipulate the situation? Because mm -hmm. the trust wasn't there, maybe with the group, with the supervisor. So it was, mm -hmm. so it was very conscious. And I was thinking in terms of, because this is new to me, the idea that within each ego state, you're thinking there's conscious and unconscious and things. How would you, because, yeah, basically, it's the question to you. How would you see that in that model? Would that be conscious child? Would the, where would you put that that behaviour? I don't know. Okay. Interesting. I you know don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, hmm. I mean, I can play with possibilities. Yeah, you know, um, uh, and other people, you know, invite other people to play play as well. Um, but certainly, I mean, it's certainly true for, um, in some, for some people, it, you know, it is the development and expression of adult ego state that you're really, you you are checking for safety. And, you know, if you, f you, you feel power played or you feel manipulated or you feel, you feel, um, coerced in some way. Um, and if that's been even more so, if it's been part of your history, you know, then so, some of the sometimes the, the you know, gr the growth is being able to spot it and even better act on it and, uh, and walk away. So that's one possibility is, you know, one possibility is that 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 is, you know, an emergence of an, of an ability to spot you know, small boundary violations and being willing to 
act on it and, 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 you know, either confront it and see if you can build trust, but it's sometimes just not even going there, just walking in the other direction. All right, so am I hearing this idea that you can sort of be, as it were, triggered in child and then very quickly bring it up to adult, what's that doing for me now? How can I sort it? But not in that sort of a one way and a real, you know, to use sort of classical, but really, no, this is how I'm feeling. It's so, for example, in that supervision group I was talking about, it really didn't feel safe to bring my whole self. And so I didn't. So that seems mm -hmm. quite sensible. But I'm also aware that it triggered other feelings of when it hasn't felt safe, which was archaic. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and part of kind of learning about yourself is, is I think it's, um, for, for me, it, it is about recognizing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable like every other human being. So, but I, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, there's nothing wrong with feeling vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. But getting perhaps getting more skilled about what that vulnerability might mean, um, what what possibilities there are, how you might you know how you might um, uh, make some rudimentary kind of guess about is this a vulnerability that I that I, I might get I might get more by staying and facing this and working through this in this context, or does it make more sense just to walk away? Because I don't even think you've got the ground to stand on to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's that's quite a refined kind of reflection, you know, but mm -hmm. I think you probably more feel it more somatically and, and viscerally as, as a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's a judgment, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a judgment, it's a judgment call. And, you know, maybe you get it wrong. Maybe you walk away and it was a mistake in hindsight. Maybe you stay and it was a mistake in hindsight. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, but but these are, you know the the i think the fine calls but the, but it's probably where that's from will just depend on a whole lot of context in terms of what it stimulates what it evokes what the context is what is there some blue there are there, are there you know are there some aspects that you can connect to while you while you tolerate the things you're not sure sure about and that navigate your way through or is it just not enough to get started I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm kind of just more sharing some of my reflections. And, uh, mm. and as you can see, I'm not coming down heavily one way or another in terms of what I think you should do. It's just, I'm sharing some of the things I yeah. might think about. Do you know what I really like about it is actually, even as you're talking, there just feels like there's more space. Mm. Not it fits in this circle, which is, it's like, oh, well, it's in here somewhere. Let's figure it out. It just yeah. feels so That's calming. Fun. Yeah, let's let's figure it out. Yeah, I think that's a great way to go, and 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 you don't have to figure it out on your own. Like, who might you, who do you trust, or uh, who can you enlist as a as an ally to help you figure it out as well? It's not so, it's not a solo sport. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, Amanda, that you made me think about when you were talking, or that I thought about in response when you were talking, was that that's unfortunately. Often in our training, we are taught that we have to stay mm. and that we have to work it out in the group. Mm. That we feel safe or we don't sleep, feel safe. Somehow it's like a, it's our job to stay. Mm. And I really like what you were saying, Graham, about actually, you know, as individuals, we have a choice. Mm. And blocking, yeah, okay, there's something going on for me here. I don't feel safe in this group. I realize that my defenses have been triggered. And you know what? I'm going to take that to a safe person and work through with them what was going on for me mm. rather than stay here and be risk being traumatized even more. Mm. It, it's that permission. You don't have to do it in that unsafe place. Um, nice. I think there's also a middle ground worth exploring. So one of the things Gottman talks about, for example, in couples work, um, he wrote a great book called The Science of Trust, by the way, I wholly recommend it. Um, but, you know, he talks about um, how important it is, you know, when, when couples, so here's your partner, someone you love deeply, 
you know, you, you, you don't want them to, them to leave you and you don't want to leave them because the relationship is basically good. It's just that you've triggered each other into defenses in that moment. Um, is permission just to take a break? Look, you know, we're both charged. You know, we're both angry. We're both hurting. Mm. Can we just take a little bit of time out, you know, and then come back to this? It's like, it's like pacing, you know, it's like recognizing something's got stirred. Mm -hmm. and figuring out how you might navigate that experience mm -hmm. and, and taking a break actually mm -hmm. can be part of that too mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, talk, i'm not talking about living apart i mean just having a cup of tea you know like getting into another room because you're charged in that moment and just taking a break gives you a chance to gather yourself to come at it perhaps explore the same issue but maybe with, with a different you know from a different ang angle or maybe with just more goodwill mm. so lots of options you know go stay take a break you know that yes endless options mm. and the thing what you're talking about amanda relates directly to you brought up pause right at the beginning and this there's something about the zone of tolerance and when you're in the group where are you and what's that about? And being curious about what what is this about that I'm not in my zone of tolerance in this room? And of course, you know, it's our job to take care of ourselves. And so the idea that we should stay whatever, mm -hmm. I think, is problematic. And anything growthful will probably have periods of discomfort, you know, mm, moments sure. that feel too much, but. But part of the growth is learning to turn, learning to uh, perhaps transform something that was un intolerable that you had to block um, into something that could be tolerable. Like that can be part of the growthful thing. But it's you know, it, but it uh, you know, it's it's not meant to be a you know, it's a, a boot camp. <laughs> mm. uh, like. I don't think it has to be, otherwise it might just be reenacting some sort of experience where you feel trapped in an intolerable situation that you, you feel you can't get out of. Mm. That, you know, I think, I think choosing to be somewhere uncomfortable because you know there's something to learn and you have enough trust in the, the environment that you will is different from you know, reenacting you know a trauma experience of being trapped um in, in you know somewhere that feels absolutely unbearable so so that was my technical answer thank you <laughs> we've got a, just over five minutes left so it might be a good time to begin perhaps wrapping up, just maybe share mm -hmm. thoughts, feelings by way of just share what's this experience been like for you? What, what might you be taking away? My, um, Graham, the, the model that you shared about the dynamics um, eagle stake model. You, this is something I'm going to take away and think about because it's really ignited my, 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 my sort of passion that I have, uh, which is to do with um, race and culture and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of, my thoughts went to, when you talk about non-conscious, unconscious and consciousness, I kind of brought in biases, you know, like our conscious bias, non-conscious bias, unconscious bias. Yes. And if we're talking about, you know, the model that you showed earlier on about from adult to adult, to me, I was thinking also combining that with the uh, Burns model of contaminated adult mm -hmm. and how all that fits in with the model that you shared with, with us. I mean, that's something I'm going to take away. I, I don't know if it's, unless there is something that you can answer very quickly, but it's, it's a future thought for me. 
Sounds sounds great. I think we were stretching into that area of um, uh, culture when we think about script and when we use the script helix. Um, really try again. It's trying to put words, images to find ways of articulating. So you know the intersectional. You know how you've got these different dimensions going on in terms of similarity and difference. Now whether that's whether that's race, gender, age. You know, like they're all happening all the time, and and they always mean something. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, wish you well. Yeah. Happy reading and thinking. <laughs> yeah, and I would invite you just to just look up and read, you know, the two, the two thousand article, and just look at the ego state model, because I think it might be easier for you if you look at the uh, co creative ego state model because it is so different from the structural model as you would normally have been taught in your training. And I think it would make a lot more sense if you looked at it from that perspective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. That was my last response to a kind of, uh, um, you know, a theoretical reflection. What else? Just by way of saying goodbye, what, uh, you would, what would you like to share? So I think it's a big ask in two minutes, Graham. I just want to say thank you. And um, it's, uh, yeah, certainly stimulated some thinking for me. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I really loved what you contributed here. Can I share that when I joined and I saw it was a small group and then it became clear really quickly, Graham, that it was going to be very interactive and discussion. I thought, oh, God, there's nowhere to hide. Oh, no. <laughs> and then I thought, well, it's all right. Well, why don't you join in then? And it's actually been way richer to actually all be sharing and talking together. So my initial thought was, oh, no. And I'm so glad it was run how it has been. So thank you. Well, I'm glad you tolerated the discomfort to get through to something that you perhaps weren't expecting. So well done. Mm -hmm. I think it's been a really great um, example of the, the co-creative process being in this group, mm. um, which I wasn't expecting, um, and I've really enjoyed, and um, it's been very thought-provoking, so I'm very grateful. Thank you. Are you doing any more of these? Is this the last one? No, we've st we, I think we've still got a few running and I'm going I'm going I'm going to be doing another one with uh, Tryan um later in the year um you know but all things are possible you know I, but there's uh, there's more coming there's more coming this year so. we're Good. running there's a series still running all the way up to Christmas right the focus of them will be will tend to now focus much more on application rather than the, the developing the theory. But there will be some running, yeah. Good. In August. A conference February. as well, James. Mm. Is there a conference that I read? There is a, yeah, thank you for mentioning it. There is a conference in Gothenburg, which, Graham, I think you're going to be there as well. I will be there. I will be there. Yeah, run by the, the, the other six of us. Yeah, and I was going to say, it looks like the same group of when well, I saw it, it was the same group of people yes. that have been, yeah, it is. That been doing this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's two days. It's towards the end of October, and it's on a sort of Saturday, Sunday, Monday. But it's just two whole days. You didn't pay me to say that, did you, Jason? <laughs> that actually just came out. <laughs> that was natural, organic, an organic process. Mary, you looked like you are going to say something before yeah i was gonna say my head is full <laughs> <laughs> in a really really lovely way thank you everybody um i've got loads going around as i've been sitting and listening i've been i've been i've been throwing it across my different relationships i've been throwing it across my therapy relationship i've been throwing it across my training I um, think when people were talking about supervision, I was I was thinking about my training and 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 in relation to that, and thinking about my personal relationships, and it's really fabulous. It's been wearing away up here, kind of. <laughs> woo. 
um, which has been brilliant. Yeah, really, really stimulating and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. Right then, shall we uh, follow, follow Karen's example and wrap up and get some dinner in our respective homes or whatever you need to do. Yeah. So, we'll wrap yeah. it up there, is that okay? Any final things before we sign off? Just very quickly, just want to say thank you, James and Graham for your gentleness. That's really impacted me today. Oh, thank oh. you, Rachel. Yeah. Thank I just you. want to say thank you to everyone for what you've brought, it's been great. Mm. Okay. Go well, well, everybody. Thanks. Hopefully see you again at another gig. Another gig, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see right. everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.